welcome on to Bob Goodrow. I hope I mentioned this was an excellent introduction to him because he is from Regis. Uh, Bob is the Global Executive Vice President of Sales for Regis. He has more than 20 years of experience helping thousands of businesses in all, of all sizes in all sectors transition to and realize the benefits of agile work. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, John, thank you very much for the Regis commercial. That's very much appreciated. Usually I have to say all that stuff, but I appreciate you doing it. This is a bit strange for me, not getting up in front of people and talking. I do that for a living, pretty much. What's strange for me is getting up and talking to people not about the workplace of the future. You've heard a lot of that. I absolutely, positively don't want to talk about Regis or the workplace of the future. What I want to talk about is the organization of the future, the people in the future, the skill sets of the future, and what's working and what's not working in today's organizations. Why do I care and why does Regis care? 90% of our research over the last 20 years has been on the workplace. Where do people want to work? How do people want to work? What do they like in the workplace? All the things we've been hearing about all day long. Instead, this time, we wanted to say, what's the big idea? What's going to be the big thing going forward over the next three to five years that we will have to cater to within our organization um, to help people and help companies and help organizations change the way they work and fundamentally work differently? So we commissioned a chap called Andrew Mawson. He worked together with the University of Cambridge in England. And we said, go away and think about it and, and come back to us and tell us what and how are organizations changing and going to change and how do they want to work in the future and what will that look like? And with that, he went away and came back with a big piece of research that told us what organizations would want, and we call that the kinetic organization. He named it the kinetic organization. Why kinetic? Life and energy. So let me just describe the research process briefly, and then we'll talk about the findings. What he did is he took 40 to 50 corporates, major global companies, and he held a series of face-to-face -face workshops, both here and in the United Kingdom. And he asked them how they work today, what they're looking for in a workplace, what's very important in your organizational structure, and what encumber, uh, what's encumbering you from doing better work from an organizational standpoint. Uh, we did that, we designed a new approach, we then fed it back to them, we did a series of online workshops, and then we ran this model against some actual work patterns, and we looked retrospectively back. If we had applied the new organizational model, the kinetic model, backwards, what would have happened had the same series of events happened in your company. Got it? So did a model, then looked backwards and applied it against reality to see what would have happened. So these are the findings. The first thing is organizations of today are not built for the future and that shouldn't surprise anybody. For years we've been all saying, all of us who come to these rooms over and over and over, property's not working, well the organization's not working either. Regis is a very good example. I live in an organization that is changing now to this new model. Um, we, for years, have siloed banking. I am the sales director. We have a marketing director. We have a finance director. We also we have our functional silos. We also have geographic silos. We have a chap who runs America, another guy who runs Europe, another guy who runs Asia Pac. Familiar? Everybody have those kind of matrix organizations with functions and geographies and they own their P&L on the geography and we're constantly making poor decisions because of that siloed mentality, because of that geographic function, because of that investment analysis, because where we should be taking our money is planes, trains and automobiles. That's the fastest growing segment of our business. Collaboration, mobile working, opening up in railway stations, it's also some of them very early days and not always the most profitable. Well, if you're a CEO or a CFO, you're taught to care about your thing. And that new fast growing area that will be the emerging thing might not get the attention. So it's the organizational design that's holding you back. It's the goals and the objectives. So that was the traditional organizational findings. 
So what is kinetic organizations? Kinetic means life and energy. And we said, let's define what kinetic organizations look like. First thing is agile. They are fast moving. There are examples of this all over. Google is a kinetic organization. Google will put people on Android or something else. And they will look to take a whole line of business, build a project team around it, have that team focused and work, and it has nothing with search, and they organize it that way. Second, they're designed to meet promises. Who are they meeting promises to? Shareholders, employees, and um, customers. And every company for the future who's going to be kinetic, who's going to work better, smarter, faster, has to be designed around those principles. They're cost-based flexible. They build that into everything. People, property, technology, every part of it. Um, innovative, perpetually competitive. They're creating and disrupting their own technology. It's Moore's Law on steroids. They're, they're constantly innovating as part of who they are, not because they have to, because they want to, and it's part of their DNA. And they have different treatments. It's not a one-size-fits-all. If we want to invest in Asia big, we can invest in Asia big because we're designed to do that. If we want to invest in a product line, we can make a big bet there because we're designed to do that. The structure of the organization doesn't hold us back. Wow. So what's that? That's not being the janitor. That's what that's not being. <laughs> what this is, is a whole series of roles, and I know it's very hard to see from the back, it's probably an eye chart. So there are copies of the research online, there's copies of the research at the stand. But if I can take you through, there are leaders and executives managing this, but there are project teams being built with very specific, non-functional, non-geographic roles being played throughout it. So, recruiters and coaches, wise owls, agility controllers, uh, rule makers and referees, but people being brought into projects. Now this cell, this organic cell, could have up to 500 people in an organization handling a new line of business and going to market. Irrespective, cross-functional, cross-geographic, yeah? So it's a new, it's an organic um, command and control structure because it's not your classic military pyramid. It's not the hierarchical structure that many of us work in today, including myself. Next, what happens when you scale that? Companies were saying they had to tie it all together and what you end up with is, is a super governor. And I know some of you are looking at me puzzled. And when I first saw this, I too was puzzled. Let it sink in. Let it reflect. This is not something you're going to do on Monday morning. This is an evolution, and we'll, we'll talk about how, how we're getting there as an organization and how we're catering for that. But when you start to see things like this, um, and even some of the ideas you heard this morning, I know for myself I was trying to pen out, so what? I just heard that, so what? What am I going to do with this? And then the more I hear Brian talk, and then I hear Peter talk, and then I hear somebody else's, the ideas start melding together. The ideas of organization, place, technology, and everything else just start melding together, and I start getting business ideas. So this for us, we are in early days of adapting new structure, but this is how it all ties together with governors in the middle and people running these projects. Again, more detail in the research itself. I want to take a few of the key principles and just talk to them and what they mean in a kinetic organization. And I'd like to focus on change and collaboration. There are many other ones, productivity, knowledge, responsibility, trust, all the things of modern working. But I'd like to focus on just two of them in the interest of time. So change, traditional organizations, infrastructure and investment is based on stability and certainty. In a kinetic organization, we're able to change and put our money where we see the opportunity quickly. Offices, absolute requirement. Um, in a kinetic organization, we're much more flexible. We can take offices as and when, and we can repurpose them. Few other things on change. Collaboration. We spent a lot of time today talking about collaboration, the importance of collaboration, the importance of bringing people together. Um, in a kinetic organization, we are empowering and we are using choice. We are using lots of um, different types of settings and places to work. Um, all the hierarchical command and control structures with fixed spaces, 
live to regret them time and time again due to mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, and everything else. So those are just very simplistic versions of what a kinetic organization will give you. How does that translate to money? So I said we did the research, we did a model, we then went back and said if we structured differently from how we put project teams together to how we invested our money, would this have an impact? And we took a financial service organization and we just took one country. This country is not Wall Street, it happens to be the UK. And we just took one country and said, if we had applied this differently for the years 2008 and 2012, what would that have changed in your P&L? It would have changed locations they went to. It would have changed consolidation strategies. Um, this particular organization shut down 25 different remote offices, didn't repurpose them, didn't leave anything behind, didn't use any alternative work, it didn't do anything. They just consolidated it into one place. That space today is still less than half occupied. The work is all happening in different parts of the UK, and the organization um, would have had a savings in that one country of 26 million pounds or 40 million dollars just on that one company in that one country. Second country, major global brand. You see them on every supermarket shelf. We did the same thing. Again, I focused on property because that's the business I'm in. The property ramifications of this from the inflexibility of long-term leases and from the inflexibility of the way they design the space functionally. They designed the marketing department here, the finance department here. And they tried to have natural adjacencies, what they had been taught in school, to have everything nice, but that's not how they worked at all. If they had broken that company up and done it project-based and done it to their way of thinking, they would have saved 88 million pounds. 88 million pounds or 120 million. So what? <clears throat> what does that mean and what does that mean for, for me, for you? Um, as you're sitting there in the office saying, what the hell is Goodrow talking about in this <laughs> kinetic organization? What it means is you're probably here now. I was a year ago and still am a functional organization with geographic silos and geographic P&Ls. What you can do is survey yourself and start to bring in <laughs> some of the kinetic principles and some of the kinetic underlying values and if you start to bring them in, you'll start getting big projects done. You'll start being able to do different things to a common goal and, and helping your company to move better, faster, smarter into new lines of business before you have to, before you have to. And, and, and living it myself, I can tell you it's a journey to repackage how you work. It's not you're moving from here to there. You're making steps along the way. If you want to know where you are on that continuum already, there's an online survey that Andrew built. You can go online, you can see where you are, you can see where your values match up, and are you moving any closer that way, and you can see some of the things that you would be doing to move. It's very complicated what I just said, and I'm talking about organizational structure, and not, not the office of the future or the workplace of the future. There is a full research report. It has tens of pages with all the backup and all the things that will help you get your brain around it. But I believe with all my heart, if you can start embracing some of these values, even in a departmental basis, I know from the show of hands, a lot of facility-based people, architectural people, a few futurists here. But even if you can get your department moving more kinetically, I think you'll, you'll make more money, get things done quicker, and enjoy going to work a lot more. So that's it, and thank you. Well, well, I'll let you lead it off. I like the fact that you're willing to talk about your own company and where you are in your own company. And I've never thought about this before, but how does Regis actually occupy its office space? Mm -hmm. Do you have headquarters offices? Do you move between space the way your clients do? Yes. Yes and, and no. Um, we have fixed office space. So we have a European headquarters. We have a U.S. headquarters in Dallas. 
we have our functional headquarters like many offices do. We also are very lucky that we have a network of places we can go to. So next week, I'll be in Amsterdam. But the funny part about next week being in Amsterdam is I'm not going to use Regis. Because I work for Regis and I want to get out of Regis. I, so I'm using the hotel next week. And we're bringing in people from all over the world for a training session. And we're going to be using a hotel. And then we'll be going and using Regis's as and when we want. The other thing we're doing, and a big part of what we do, um, and I mentioned fastest growing, is planes, trains, and automobiles. We just signed a deal with the Dutch Railways, and we're putting Regis centers in central stations all across Holland, and we're connecting them up. So I will use a Regis center in New York City. My colleague and I, we went in this morning. We worked at Rockefeller Center. I use, wherever I am is my office. I use Regis as a customer. Everyone in Regis has a card, and we have to book using our own system. We eat our own dog food. That's how we call it internally. Um, so we book. I show up. I turn up. I use our training facilities, video conferencing. We use them internally. So we do both. We have fixed offices, and then we use our space on the go because we can and because it works. Hi, I'm Peter Miskovich. Be very interested, Bob, in your uh, perspectives on co-working. Given that you know Regis was really a pioneer, where do you see co-working? What you just described in the Netherlands? Yes. Um, is it a viable long-term business model trend? Something that you folks will invest in and expand it? Thank you. The the, the question was about co-working, and and again, I think we were put in that executive suite bucket earlier. The 400 million. Um, Regis is 1.2 billion. So um, where do I see co-working? Co-working is the fastest segment of the executive suite, the fastest growing part of the executive suite. For Regis, I don't believe um, that it's one thing and it's a standalone thing called co-working center. Some people do, and they're making a lot of money building businesses as co-working facilities, and that's great. I see it as choice and a network of places, and in Regis we have a thing called the campus. And that's our co-working facility within Regis. So within Regis, there will be offices, meeting rooms, collaboration, video conferencing, co-working. Um, what's funny is, about two years ago, my sales guys could not sell it. And what they said to me is, Bob, you're not listening. Customers don't want to share an office. Customers don't want to talk in front of somebody else. Customers don't want to interact with a stranger. And it took us a lot of time to figure out how to make the rooms right, how to get the acoustics, how to enlarge them. There was safety with more numbers than with less numbers. There was just lots and lots of learning. We were too early, and we really screwed it up at the beginning. And the more we got into it, we realized it's just one big thing. It's just another choice, and that for some types of workers, that's good. The other thing we realized is co-working is not an all-day, everyday thing. So when we were trying to sell a desk in a shared room, co-working was a dismal failure. When we started selling subscriptions, five-day, 10-day, use it when you want, pop in, pop out, all of a sudden it became popular. So it's a fast-growing segment. It's a sub-segment of our destination. So it's one part of the destination, not the whole destination. <laughs> Um, but but it's great and it works for certain applications for certain times. Sometimes you need a private room for an interview, and sometimes you just need an hour to do some work, make some calls, do your email, and pop out and come to work tech, which is what I did this morning, and and, and it worked. You know, it was there, it worked, and then I came here. So that's my feeling on co-working. We've learned a lot, um, and I think we were a bit too early actually. Okay. Um, one more question. Okay. Well, a great question in the audience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.